Uh, yeah, I'm used to the council. Uh, but I'd like to welcome, and I wish we had a few more squeezing in here, but maybe they'll show up as we get going. Uh, we have Dan Clark here from the Local Government Center who will hopefully <coughs> help educate some of us uh, on our SIDs, some of the options we have. Uh, frustrated with infrastructure like probably 90% of the towns around. And, uh, so we're looking for solutions. And hopefully he'll give some, at least some ideas and some directions. Uh, he'll visit with, uh, give you some ideas out there and then let you open up for questions and definitely ask him the questions if anyone has them and ideas that you have, let's discuss it. So go ahead, Dan. Thank you, Mayor. You got to do it now because you're likely not going to clap when I leave. Get like, that guy out of town. Well, you're almost so. If, Mayor Solomon, if it was Sunday, is it Sunday that daylight savings yep. ends? It'd be five o'clock. So we got all the time. Really screwed me up further. That's right. Uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, Mayor Solomon and the council for uh, inviting me here to visit with you. Uh, as Ms. Solomon mentioned, my name is Dan Clark. I'm the director of the Local Government Center at Montana State University. Our center is housed underneath the Extension Service, so we're part of the MSU Extension. Uh, our mission is to provide technical assistance, research, and training to local governments across the state to build their capacity to better serve the citizens of Montana. So this is part of our mission. I'm happy to be here, happy to, to share uh, some of my thoughts. Uh, or at your request, try to answer some of the questions you might have. So I've been here to uh, ask to visit with you about special improvement districts. And, uh, and as you can see, I did not come with a PowerPoint, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, you're going to have to get all of me, sparkling personality that it is, to try to hack through this and see if we can not come to some understanding of how this uh, special improvement districts work with the community. And, and to tell you, just, just to frame out your expectation, I am not going to go through point by point uh, how to set up a special improvement district. That's laid out in the law. It's something that's clear there. It's something I don't feel we need to go over, the technical part of it, kind of down in the weeds. That's not really what I think you're all missing the World Series for, to come here and learn the technical part of a special improvement district. district. But I do want to talk about the bigger picture. I want to talk about uh, municipal government, I want to talk about the duties, the responsibilities of a city and a city government, the role of its citizens, those relationships, uh, defining expectations of how we want to live in a community and how we're going to pay for it. Uh, and those are challenging and difficult conversations to have. And so I want to help uh, clarify and, and kind of define for you a better way to look at uh, your relationship with the city and the city's relationship with you, and try to come to a, an equilibrium about how we're going to fund the services that we, we, uh, that we need. Right? So, with that, I want to start out uh, by asking a question. Uh, what is the difference between fairness and equity? What do you think about that? Fairness and equity. In, in particular, the context of, of local government. Are they synonymous? Or are they different? If they are different, they're really different. It's not a rhetorical question. You can join in. You can ask. You're going to quiz us later? That's right. So what are your thoughts? Wouldn't fairness, wouldn't fairness be something that's good for the whole, whereas equity is something that's worth value? Hmm. It might be. I'll have to think about what you said there a little bit more to see how it fits within what I'm thinking. Um, Equity presupposes that the municipal government takes direct actions to level the playing field for those that may be disadvantaged. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> I like where you're going there. So let me, let me throw this out. Equity, if you think about equity, it's where you would treat everybody the same. Right? And then fairness, we would try to treat people based on what their need might be. Right? Where we're going to treat you differently because your need might be different than someone else. So you think about your children. Do you treat your children equitably? They all get the same, or do you treat them based on what they need? Assuming you have children. 
right? So, so as you think about that, and so I think there are certain times within policy making, you're trying to think about how do we treat people equitably, and how do we treat people fairly? Okay, so if you think about, and maybe this, maybe you drill too deep and it might be confusing, but if you think about water, water rates, on one side, there's an equality to it that everyone pays the same amount for the water. On the other side, there's a fairness that if I choose to use more water, I'm going to pay for more, and if I use less water, I pay less. Does that make sense? So, property taxes, fair or equitable? So on one hand, everyone's going to pay property tax. Everyone's treated the same, but on the other hand, there's a level of fairness that you're only going to pay. So we don't, so don't say every lot's going to be assessed the same amount of taxes, but it's based on a rate. So if you have a million dollar mansion, you're going to pay more based on its assessed value than someone that has a single wide trailer. They'll pay less, right? Everyone pays, but there, there's going to be a fairness there that we're going to pay based on this value. All right, so, the, so I just want to kind of kick that around a little bit, have you think about the fairness and equity issue, particularly when we get to this discussion around <coughs> special improvement districts. Um, so, so that's kind of rattling around in your head. The other thing I want to bring up, uh, a lot of communities have these, and I asked earlier, and the city of Haver has this as well, but there's a capital improvement plan. What we strongly encourage communities to have or develop is a capital improvement plan or a capital improvement program. So what do you think a capital improvement program is? Rainy day fund. Okay, so we're putting money aside for rainy day, kind of. Right? So we're putting money aside, but there's a purpose for that money. Long-term upgrades? Right. So this building here, will it last forever in its current state? No. No. It needs, so this floor is shiny. This is really shiny. Someone's doing a good job here. This floor at some point needs to be replaced. Right? It has a useful life. So somewhere in your capital improvement plan, may not be to this level of detail, but it might be deal with the flooring in all of City Hall. And you've got to think about what's, it's got a useful life of 20 years. We're into this 28. <laughs> We're into this, you know, 10 years. So we've got to have money in another 10 years to replace all the flooring. So, and this is done in private business. It's, it's, it's widely done, right? We try to figure out how we pay for things. And so the city should be putting money aside a little bit each year so that when it comes, 20 years comes do, it's time to replace the flooring, they have money set aside to replace the flooring, or the paint, or the roof. Uh, the, the challenge that we're seeing across the state, not just in Haver or Hill County or along the High Line, but across the state, is it's getting more and more challenging for local governments to find the resources, the money, to address their capital needs. And that their budgeting becomes more and more constrained to annual operations. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so what's happening is it's not that we're kicking the can down the road or deferring maintenance out of a choice because we want to give a tax break to everybody. So we're, gonna, we're not going to do anything safe for the future. We want to make really low taxes today. It's just they don't have enough resources coming in, revenue coming in to take care of annual operations and deal with the capital needs. Is that clear? So uh, in a previous life, I was the mayor of a small town in Montana. And one of the challenges we had was a water system that was put in the 1930s. It had a useful life of about 40 years, right? Given the, the, the materials used and the, the quality of uh, the materials at the time, it had a useful life of 40 years. I became mayor in early 2000s, like 2002, and uh, it was still the same water system. So we had a 70-year-old water system that had a useful life of 40 years. And we'd been doing all we could historically to keep that thing going. But as it turned out, we were pumping 4 million gallons of water through that delivery system. I'm sorry, 10 million gallons through the delivery system, right? From our tanks, going out to the pipes, 10 million gallons. What was coming through water meters each month was saying that we're only using or consuming 4 million. 10 million going in, 4 million coming out. So where do you think the other six million gallons were going? Into the ground, right? So here's another interesting fact. Before we put the water meters in, what they would do is they'd go down and they'd look at the, the, the meter at the, the, 
the big tanks and say, oh, 10 million gallons, and they'd go down and they'd estimate the flow coming into the sewer lagoon. Guess what that amount was? 10 million gallons. They're saying, well, obviously, we're just high water users. We just consume a lot of water. 10 million going in, 10 million coming out. That makes sense. Until we put the meters in, we realized, oh, we're losing 6 million gallons. So only 4 million gallons is going into the, the sewer system. Where's the other 6 million gallons coming from that's going into the lagoon? It's infiltrating. We have cracks and problems in our, in our sewer system that water's in, infiltrating. And so we're de all the water we're pushing out is now going into the sewer system. Right? So that was one of those challenges we realized we, we've got to deal with this. Right? We can't keep kicking the can down the road. And, and at the time, before I came mayor, just before I came mayor, the, the water rates were $15 a month flat fee, no matter what you used. Equitable. Everybody <laughs> pays 15 bucks, right? And how much you use, we're all paying 15 bucks. That didn't even cover maintenance and operation of the system, much less depreciation and replacement. There was a business that came to town, a manufacturing business that was interested in, in our community because of our community. They liked our community, they liked how big we were, they liked the look of our community, they liked our proximity to recreation and opportunities there. They thought they could locate here and invest in our community. They said historically we have a history of being corporate neighbors, that we want to invest in small towns. They said we could easily go to a big city, but it's not nearly as fun as being in a small town where we can be a part of a community. But one of the things they needed for their operation was a lot of water, clean water. They said, your water is fantastic. It's the right temperature, the right quality. Not a lot needs to be done. We can take this water and use it just as it is. We said, fantastic. So the problem is, is we're going to be located here, the only space we had available for them. We had no way to get water there, nor did ours. We had the volume of water available, but we couldn't deliver it to them because of our leaking system. And there's no way for us to reconcile that without them having to pay millions of dollars to improve the system in order for them to get water. And if any of you are business people, you're saying, yeah, that's not going to work for us. Right? You've got to fix your thing for us to be here. And so they left and went to another, another community. And it really shocked our small little community. We realized we lost an opportunity because we have not been keeping up on our infrastructure. And that amount of time now, it's been since the early 2000s, and I've just learned that both the water system and the sewer system have been fixed and brought up into another, you know, up to code, up to compliance. They're working, operating well. Uh, but it was an investment of, I want to say between seven and nine million dollars that they made over 15 years. Right. So it's, it's not cheap, right? And the option of going back to uh, a privy in the backyard <coughs> in, a, in your own personal well, <coughs> that's not going to work either, right? So, uh, so one of the, the definitions of government <coughs> is you think about what is the role of government? What's its purpose? It's where we come together as a community and we, we recognize there are certain things that we cannot do as individuals. We have certain responsibilities that we have as individuals that I can do my part. But there are certain things I can't do my part in, right? I, I have to have a collective. We have to come together as a community, and we have to do certain things collectively that we can't do individually. What are some of those things that you can think of that we do collectively that we can't do individually? Fire. Fire. Fire protection, right? It makes sense. We all can't have our own little fire protection or just worry about our own home or our own business. We've got to come together. We chip in some resources, some money for Fire protection. What's another thing? That garbage we can do? collection. Garbage collection, right? So garbage <laughs> collection, fire. Law enforcement. Law enforcement. Utilities. Utilities. Water, sewer, garbage collection. Local court system. Court system, right? So we have certain ordinances and laws that we create to govern ourselves. And then when people run afoul of that, we have a, a way to fairly judge their behavior as a community and decide how we're going to levy punishment. About transportation. Think about when you woke up this morning, how many interactions you had with the city of Hattie <clears throat> in the course of your day. Oh, man. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's insidious, isn't it? It's just, it's always there. Pay my taxes. Yeah. So you woke up this morning and probably, you know, you used the restroom and you got, pulled out of the street. As soon as you left your property, got on the street, you were back on the city of Haber's property. You used water, you used uh, sewer, you probably ate breakfast and threw something away that's going to the garbage collection system. You know, all those things, we've come together as a community to decide these things are important for us to take care of. And we have decided how to do this, and that's where we elect officials who represent our needs and interests. And they have certain duties. It's a responsibility and duty of your elected officials to take care of those things that we've said, this is what we do collectively. So we try to hold them accountable. We expect them to make sure our water is clean, clear, appropriate pressure, sewer is taken care of. We don't care where it goes, it just goes away. <laughs> Deal with it somewhere, right? Garbage collection. Uh, libraries, uh, school districts are another thing, but we educate our children, we come together and say, well, how are we going to educate ourselves? So there's all these things that we're, we're doing, and we have these elected representatives to help us through that process, to make decisions for the collective. So that's kind of a civics 101, but it kind of helps you figure out that you have a role in this. You have a certain expectation of these duties being met. And this is where the, the, the rub happens, right? We want to make sure that we have a safe, clean uh, community to live in, that delivers these, uh, these services properly and appropriately, that meets our needs and, and our, uh, satisfies our expectations. But somehow that has to be paid for. Right? So do, in these situations, particularly at the local level, uh, it's been evolving, but is it appropriate for the city of Haver, or are there opportunities for the city of Haver to look to Helena to say, hey, are there big grants, big loans, big things that we can get from you? to help us with our, our local needs. Appropriate, ineffective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love to ask them, but they're not answering. They're not answering, right? <laughs> but they're not answering the phone. There's not a lot of money there, right? Because they're worried about how do we deliver the statewide services. We got certain duties as a state to deliver certain services. So they're struggling to try to help meet their demand. You're struggling to meet your demand. So you can't look to them and say, hey, give us some resources. How about the federal government? Are they an outlet that we can look to? No. Less and less. They have less and less money. We're divesting. We're divesting in supporting on a federal level these local communities. Is that accurate, Paul? So, so what has been helpful in the past in finding resources to support us, those are getting further uh, dwindling and it's getting harder and harder for us to find those resources. So it's becoming more upon, incumbent upon us, the locals, to take care of these issues. Uh, I had a thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's, and that's kind of the rub. That's, oh, that's the rub that we're at. So let me ask you this. Um, j just for, uh, let's talk about services here real quick. Oh, this is. And spelling doesn't count on flip charts, just to let you know. <laughs> Is that spelled right? <laughs> what are some of the services, the, the responsibilities of the city to deliver, or those uh, services or services? We mentioned some of them already. So Water. What? Water. There's fire. Water. Sewer. Sewer. Electricity. Garbage. Garbage. Police. Courts. Street lights. Library. Park. Disaster help. Parks. Do you have a uh, ambulance? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. The city's responsible yeah. for yeah. Yeah. city. Yeah. So ambulance. Parks. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, already have parks. Oh yeah, I heard it. Still rattling around. Right Storm there. sewer. Storm sewer. Roads. Uh, so roads. Oh, I missed colors there. Storm. Maintenance. And then yeah, yeah now we have maintenance. Mm -hmm. So also all this, all this are capital investments as well. So we've got annual operations and maintenance, and it's a capital investment. 
Right. Why do you change the oil in your pickup truck? Okay. So there's certain maintenance you have to do in order to maintain that infrastructure so it lasts longer. But at some point, is your pickup truck going to just not work anymore? Yeah. So at some point, you have to replace that. So I'm just trying to bring some parallels to you to help you sort of appreciate this. So we have a lot of these services. We're trying to figure out how do we fund them. Now, the next one I want to ask you is what are the funding sources? And this might be inside baseball. Can I say that? <laughs> inside baseball. Yeah, it's World Series one. All right. uh, sources. I don't know what that's going. So funding sources. And so I might have to look at some of the staff to help us figure that out. But what are some guesses that you have as the public? Where do you? How does the city fund all of this? Where yeah. does the money come from? Yeah. Taxes. Taxes of what? To be clear. Property. Property tax. Uh -huh. The state has multiple funding sources. I just want to point this out. I'm, I'm poking a bear now. Are there any legislators in the room? Just poking the bear here. The state has multiple tax revenue sources in which they can fund state government. Basically, it comes down for you folks at the local level, it's property tax. That's the majority of your funding source. You don't have an income tax, you don't have a sales tax, it's property tax. Well, where the fees fit in there? Well, we're getting to that. Okay. <laughs> but, but, so, but a majority. So, so now we have funding sources, we've got property tax, right? All right. And then, oh, I was going to do this. I was going to draw boxes. <laughs> boxes and say, okay, because they're like buckets. What are the buckets? So, so we'll say, okay, we're going to have a bucket here. Property tax. And, and, a little nuance here, where would you put your entitlement check? What? Kind of under that box. Okay, that is spring. <coughs> well, no, entitlement is actually comes from a user fee, so it's it's a from the state. Non-tax revenue. Non revenue. So let's put let's put another box. Non-tax revenue. And that's what we basically call for Poorly worded. Now it's poorly worded. They call it the entitlement share. This was back in 2001. They had a big bill. It took years for this legislature to work through and figure out how to come up with this big bill. It redid the whole tax system. Basically, a lot of taxes used to be collected locally, and then they're sent to Helena, sent to the county. It's just going on. And they said, this is a big mess. Why don't we just collect all these things centrally in Helena, and then we'll divvy the money back up to the cities and counties? A lot of faith went into that. <laughs> Are you going to send us the check? So that's always been a debate almost now that all those legislators that were in, in the state legislature at the time, they're all gone due to term. This current legislature doesn't have the same affinity to the commitments <laughs> that were made by previous <laughs> legislature. So every year it's a battle to maintain that. Again, poking the barrel a little bit here. But I just want you to know that this is one of the things that, that these guys are fighting in Helena every two years trying to maintain what is rightfully the cities. All right. But they want to, okay. All right. What were some other sources of revenue? Service fees. fees All right. And those would be fees associated with what? Water, Water sewer, sewer, garbage. Garbage, right? So what do I call those? You call them, uh, we'll call them enterprise funds. Enterprise funds, right? And so can, can the city, Use water funds to pay for garbage collection. <coughs> no. Can or for sewer to pay for water. No. <clears throat> so when they collect and they set up the fee structure for their water, what they're looking at is what is our annual maintenance, or what does it cost to maintain, uh, operate, what's the depreciation and replacement? What loans do we have? What, do we, what loans do we have to service in order to make sure, right? So you probably have a base rate, my guess, a base rate, and then you have user usage on top of that. And so I was going to write something here, and I forgot what it was going to be. What was I just talking about? Enterprise, Enterprise funds. Fees. Sale of oh, bonds. Okay. All right. So we've got, we've got maintenance, operation. Depreciation and replacement. So
So last time, I don't, so when we redid our water sewer system in the small town I was married, and I was there for only a small time and they kept working on it. At the time, we had, we, we had to put in meters, was the first thing. They said, look, we're not, we're not going to give you any grants or any loans if you're doing a flat fee. That just is not working for us. You put in some meters and you get a proper, appropriate rate structure based on maintenance, operation, appreciation, replacement. Then you'll qualify for some of these funding sources, which now are mostly gone. <laughs> a few of them are still around. Right, so we could qualify for some of these funding sources. Once we demonstrated that we had a plan to where, and here's the, the reason why I'm saying this, is that I think the state and the feds were teeing up the fact that we're not going to be able to do this forever. Get, this, get your rates in line so that in 40 years you're not back out looking for another handout. Because you ran your system so lean, you just covered maintenance, right? And so now you're back with your handout. They don't want that. They want you to be self-sufficient so that in 40 years you have enough set aside in your depreciation and replacement fund that you can take care of your own stuff. Right? So there's a whole big effort through the 90s and early 2000s across the state to try to get everybody on, on the same page in that respect and made a substantial public investment across the state in our infrastructure. All right, so I want you to be thinking about that. Go ahead. So can I ask a point of clarification? Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, well I, I'm going to direct this question to Doug and Tim then. Oh, okay. Okay. In what you're calling enterprise funds, which I'd like to call fees, in the terms of water and sewer, is what we are paying in those enterprise funds, in, that, in those two areas, how much of the operations and uh, maintenance is being covered with those fees you collect versus what you need to raise for taxes for the other thing. I mean, does it cover operations? I guess it goes in the enterprise, in the enterprise fund, it, it's all of it. Enterprise it funds are is run as, as closely to a business as possible and each entity is, is okay, its so own. So, so every, even the water, the water is self-sufficient on the fees that it collects. The sewer is self-sufficient on the fees that it collects. But None of our fees goes to upgrading, replacement, or anything like that. Or in the water and sewer fund, yes. Oh, it does. Oh, oh yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, you know, they last year we did uh, uh, the water tank improvements, and uh, that was all funded in replacement, out of replacement. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We had a new mayor. This is what's great about traveling around the state. I got all sorts of stories. A new mayor in a large municipality, some of your size, further east from here. Figure out that <laughs> uh, was elected and looked at that water and sewer fund, and there was like a 1.3 or billion dollars sitting in there. This is you know sizable community. He said, "My goodness, a lot of money." So he thought it was was the important thing to do is give all that money back to the people. We're going to lower our rates, and drain out that. And I thought, dude, you can't do that because <laughs> what are you going to pay for when it's? I said, "How? When was the last time you did a, a major upgrade in your system?" So probably 20 years ago. It's still working fine. Turn my water on, water comes out. Oh my goodness. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah. So that we've got another community right now who's trying to reduce their water sewer because they think there's too much in that fund. And I'm thinking, I don't think there's enough. <coughs> right. So, so, so part of that is you got to think about what's the long term. What is it going to cost to replace so many uh, feet of pipe in 20 years? you got smart engineers and folks that can calculate that out, you know, cost of whatever over time, blah, 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 construction cost. And the last thing, this is about what it's going to cost. So you should be trying to put money aside. I'm sure you are putting money aside, anticipating what that's going to cost. That's part of your capital improvement plan that you're looking what those costs are. And these funds here are the best that they can probably operate the systems with that in mind. It's the transportation, your streets. Okay. There's where your problem is. Right, so let me finish this, or buckets, got to finish our buckets. What are the buckets of revenue that you have that you can rely upon? You can rely upon. What's that? Fines, <laughs> court fines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would not. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> we, we always try, yeah. <laughs> we try to get them not to rely upon, because that's what will happen, is they get a new judge, and suddenly the fines aren't the same. So, okay. Judge. <laughs> uh, so, do you have any special mill levies? 
voted in the levies that are out there? Yeah, just permissive. Oh, just permissive. permissive. So as an option, a revenue stream would be a mill levy. That, ooh, uh, don't, sorry, don't pay attention to that. It's supposed to be blue. <laughs> Somebody who's driving you nuts at this point. So, no, so one option for the city to generate additional revenue is they can go ask you. They can say, hey, look, we have a need. We need to upgrade our fire department, or we need uh, new, uh, a couple new officers and patrol cars, or whatever that might be. We need to fix the library. It's falling apart. We need to make it a substantial investment there. Whatever that would be, usually a very specific ask. And they would ask you, do you want to increase your property tax beyond what you're already being able to tax them by law? They're already stuck at this is what we can tax you at. We want to go above that legal limit that this, the legislature's placed on you. And, and asking you, do you want to go above that limit? And take that money for that specific purpose. That's what you can use for an additional mill money. Just so you know, we've done that twice. And they turn us down both times. <laughs> okay. Right. So here, and this, this, is, you start seeing the rub here, right? And so part of this is we're trying to balance out. As you're trying to figure out, as the city council and the administration is trying to figure out, what is that water rate? In the back of their mind is still they're thinking, can they afford this? Right? Can they afford what we're charging? And that's another thing. It's always they're trying to balance because they don't want to have a mutiny. You all show up with pitchforks and torches saying, no, we're not going to pay $180 a month for water, <coughs> right? And so you're trying to find that balance. And so you might say, well, we want to have X amount of dollars in 20 years, but there's no way you all are going to go for that. So we're going to extend that out to 30 or 40 or whatever. We're going to put money away slower at a slower rate because that's all the more that the community is willing to pay. Does that make sense? So there's a, po there's a political component to this as well. Went out for a mill levy. Asked twice, right? If you're unhappy with this particular service we're offering, but we don't have any more money in our buckets, we're just mostly concerned about annual operations, but that maintenance thing, that depreciation thing, and that long-term investment of, of replacement is still wildly underfunded. And if you're not keeping up with maintenance even, right? So then how do we fix this? And the, one of the problems is, it's usually coming through here, right? It's probably property taxes. But another tool in the toolbox the city has is what the legislature, and in our Constitution, Montana's Constitution, adopted in 1972, says and allows municipalities <coughs> to create special improvement districts. It's not a tax, it's a fee for a particular service. Right? So there's a whole structure within the law that says this is how you go about the process. <coughs> Like I said before, I'm not going to go and outline that process. That you can look it up. I've got it printed out here. It's really boring. <laughs> oh, can you share a little bit? Just because a lot of people here want to hear a little bit about that. So, so the SIB, the Special Improvement District, is going to be uh, intended for a particular purpose. They say there are certain things that you can use these for, right? Uh, you have a road maintenance district. That road maintenance district, maintenance is the key word, right? You can maintain the road with those funds, but you can't rebuild the road with those funds, right? You can only do so much on a road on the maintenance within that maintenance sphere before the, the, the lawyers say you can't, you can't do, what you're planning to do is beyond maintenance, now it's reconstruction, right? So if you've gotten to a point with your transportation, it's, it's, it is such a state that it needs to be reconstructed, That maintenance district is not available to you. Now you got to look back over here. And if this is already tied up in your property tax, it's tied up trying to maintain all of this. <clears throat> Here's the problem, right? So one option is we can do an SIV. So a special improvement district. You can even use a special improvement district to replank your sidewalks. <laughs> That's how old this lot is. I don't know who other than Ennis might have planks. I don't know who else would have a plank on their, their sidewalks. So, so, so this in mind, this is the, the idea, is how do we maintain our infrastructure over time? How do we fund that? Recognize, and I think way back in 72, that we only have so many buckets that they can use. So again, the city's trying to exploit all the tools in the toolbox to take care of what they have a duty to take care of, which would be these things. Do we have roads on there? I hope so. Anyway, 
so that's kind of their, they have that duty, so they're kind of up against the, the, the wall here. So how do we fund those things given our constraints? So some of the things that you, I love getting old. <laughs> I've got this fancy watch that when I get an email, it shows up on my wrist. I can't see. <laughs> 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 if I can't read it, it's really frustrating. <sighs> First world problems, right? <laughs> Little Guatemalans aren't working. <coughs> watches right now, I'm sure. All right, so some of the things that we can do is uh, create a special improvement district and order the whole, uh, order the whole or a portion <coughs> in your length, width of one of the more streets or avenues, right? So they can build with these funds, right? So. And, and I said earlier, it's not a tax, it's a fee. So you're going to pay a fee for a specific service or for a purpose. Let me tell you another story, how to operation like that. I've got probably a couple. So one, when I, again, when I was back in this uh, small town in Montana, the mayor, one of the things that I recognized early on is that we were doing leaf pickup. This was a town that had a whole lot of big cottonwood trees and, uh, and ash trees. So in the fall, about this time, we have all these leaves dropping, and the city, for whatever reason, had decided it was their duty to collect leaves. So everybody bring all the leaves out into the street, then they come down, and they bought this old truck and a, and a leaf vacuum that was surplused in 1972. Yeah, you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> it was awful. So they had to take two guys, the back of this big leaf vacuum with rakes fluffing up the leaves so it gets sucked up in there and then the propeller was so damaged that it would just shred them and it would blow this fine mist of leaf out of the community and a little bit was going into the truck. Oh my goodness. So we got complaints about that and then we realized, and what the other thing that kind of evolved over time is that somebody would call the, op, the, the city hall and we, we're responsive, right? We want to help. We, I have not found a municipality around the state that is like, yeah, screw you. you know, they're all like, we're here to serve you. So they call up and say, hey, can you come down my alley? Like, it's probably a widow or somebody. So can you come down and pick up my grass clippings in the alley? Not a problem. Ooh. Word gets around the senior center. You just call the city office. <laughs> 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 not a right? And so pretty soon, we're getting all these calls, and we're randomly going around town picking up grass clippings and other stuff. Well, then it became a point where they said, all right, we're just going to do that as part of our service. These are all uncompensated services, right? It's not part of our garbage collection fee. It was never calculated in the fee to do, provide the service. So how we were funding that was out of our property tax. And after a while, now here's the data we had. I asked our public works director, I want you to keep track of this year of all the expenses that we have in this, this enterprise that we're offering. <coughs> 600 dump truck loads of grass, clippings, and leaves went to the roll-off site, which then traveled 70 miles to the dump where all this vegetative matter was entombed in the ground for eternity. Did that make sense? Thank you. I didn't think so either. <laughs> it didn't make sense. Why? Wow. And, and this was, again, all uncompensated service. We're providing the service out of your property tax. So by doing that, Running all that equipment on the road. Oh, front end loader. Mm, beautiful. Hundred some odd thousand dollar front end loader worn out driving down an alley, scooping grass clippings, backing up, dumping in the dump truck, running down the alley, scooping. Literally wore it out. So we had to buy a new. Okay. I'm not there anymore. Not <laughs> so I, we finally said, look, we told the community we can't do this anymore. Uh, we can't provide this service without additional compensation. And we can't find any money in the budget to do this without compromising some of the other critical things that we have to offer. This, I think, is a nice service, but it's not core to who we are and what we do. So we said we're backing off, and you have to be responsible for your own grass clippings and your own leaves. The next year, after them having to collect and haul off their leaves, they came to City Hall and said, ah, figure it out. We're not doing this again. You figure this out. It's one of those things collectively is better than individually. So we don't have that kind of time. We're willing to pay, figure it out. So we proposed a special improvement district. And in that special improvement district, we said, we are going to buy a new leaf vacuum. We're going to, with those funds, we'll hire a part-time employee 
what do you call them, part-time temporary that's going to work just for that season to collect leaves. We worked with a citizen to create a, a couple lots, vacant lots, and he then did a mulching, what do you call it, a composting. Compost. He composted all, and then the citizens could come back in the spring and collect it for their gardens. So we had this wonderful system, and and we had cost share, we had, we, we backfilled a little bit with, back when we had, what was that, that, that community transportation funds or something that's gone now? CTEP, that's gone now, but we had, so we, so we cost shared, some of this was CTEP, so we said, look, we're getting some outside funds to come in, we want you to cover this share, and we backfilled a little bit with the general fund. So there's three ways, but we said everyone's gonna pay into it, everyone's part of the problem, everybody benefits from the outcome. So with that, we created this SID, and how we assessed that was based on frontage. Oh, not only, not only uh, leaves, and collection leaves, which, by the way, is one of those things that you can have as a special improvement district. For leaf collection, we also have terrible sidewalks, because of all those cottonwoods, are they have deep roots or shallow roots? And we love the plant wall, because we want to have all this protection from the wind, but it tore up all the sidewalks. Now here's another thing just for you to think about. When you walk around that town on the corners, the intersections of the corners, you would see stamped in the sidewalk, the company that did the contract to the engineer or whatever in 1913. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've built another <coughs> sidewalk in that town since 1913, right? We had lost <coughs> that idea of how do we build community they made a tremendous investment at the time. Think about a struggling community in 1913. It wasn't the greatest economy. And they're investing in sidewalks. They built a courthouse. They lived in sod huts, but they thought, this is what we need to do. We need to build community. They built churches. They built a courthouse. They built sidewalks. They built sewer lines. They built, you know, they built community. We've been living on that investment for 100 years. So part of that money went to fixing those sidewalks that were high hazard, that was a liability to the city. Someone trips and falls on it, we've got to pay that out. And that's not right. It's not right that citizens would have to be worried about the uneven sidewalks. We have a duty to provide safe sidewalks to walk on. So we're finding a solution to deal with. And slowly over time, we figured, calculated how much you know, leaf pickup cost would be and how many linear feet of sidewalk we could do each year. We identified those high hazard sidewalks, and we had a plan to address them. And over time, we would get all those sidewalks taken care of that were impacted and deal with the trees that were all dying because they're, they're all planted 100 years ago and cottonwoods only last 70 years. So again, <laughs> and we had a whole plan on how to reforest our community so we don't lose all of our cottonwoods and be some desert. You see where I'm going with this? It's a whole thing. It's all connected. And I think the people started recognizing and appreciating, oh, we're starting to see things done. We're dealing with some of these old trees that are high hazard. Deal with these high hazard sidewalks. You're taking care of the leaves that I don't have to take care of. We found a solution with this person who's going to compost it for us, and now I can access it as a resource in the springtime. And it's costing me the grand sum of 17 cents per linear foot of frontage of my house. And that generated a sufficient revenue for us. So it's not a tax, it was a, it was a fee. It was a fee specific for that purpose. We couldn't use it to backfill law enforcement. We couldn't use it to backfill fixing the streets or the roads or chip sealing. It was only for that purpose. Question. Yeah, if you're raising, I, I don't know how many of us are here as I am specifically because of an interest in street improvement, but I am one of those. And that raises the question of who is we? Who has to agree if I want to see a street improved? We've tried the mill levy route, it's failed. Mostly because the need in this city is so enormous, even a minor mill levy that would have addressed a small part of that need still wasn't enough. Was, well, it, it was overwhelming taxation for people who would not directly have benefited, so it didn't pass. Yeah. But there are a number of us I know who are interested in this street or that street. Who's the we? Last so that's a good question. question. A couple ways in which this can be initiated. One is an SID can be initiated by the city. That's the, the primary way in which they do that. They have what, a resolution of intent, right? So, be, 
So let me back up. Before you even do a resolution of intent, right, the city and the city council probably need to sit back and look at their capital improvement plan, look at all that's going on, what are we supposed to be doing, what's, what do we have for resources, what's not being done, where is it that we, we you know, the highest need, you know. So they, they have this bigger thought process and conversation about how do we address some of these issues, like our transportation and our streets. Which situations. I think we were attempting with this mill limit. Yeah. So, so that didn't work, so how do we use the SID? So they could say, okay, we're going to do an SID, uh, and so it comes from the council saying, look, could, could and, and so mayor, we're, we're asking, we're going to pass, or ask you to research this. Give us some suggestions. What's it going to cost? What's, what's, who's the we? What's the boundaries? Is it going to be a neighborhood by neighborhood? Are we going to do one citywide thing? What's the, the, the general cost? Then they have a, a, a resolution of intent. Now they have something to respond to. They say, okay, we're going to look at this and drill down on it. So it's the initial idea of what's going on, what do we want to do big picture. 20,000 foot view. Plan that's over time, right? So it's that kind of big picture thing. Council says, okay, let's go to the next step, resolution of intent. Then they sit down and say, okay, here's the specifics. We're going to do this, this year, this next year, whatever. This is what it's going to cost. This is how we're going to finance it by a linear foot or by square footage of the lot or whatever. And then there's the resolution to do the SID. As citizens, you can engage that process. You can, you can help shape that through the political process. You come to meetings, you, you, if you're, he's a wise guy, or a guy that's wise. <laughs> he might say, well, I'll, let's get together a, a, a committee of people to look at this and help inform the city as we go down this process so that the public is engaged and participating in the decision-making process. Then they frame it out. I said that for a purpose, now I forgot the purpose. But so, so you have that engagement. So you can form and, and shape the way this is going to look over time. So the city can't. In, the impose. city can't make those people pay for it. Sure. I, well, I, well, no, they have to agree to pay for it. Yeah, I guess so. So, I mean, so then, right. so you say, okay, now here's here's our proposal for the resolution, and the public can protest it. So that is a protest that they have to come in. So it's. They need to notice all the, the, those that are on record as a landowner or property owner, they get a notice saying this is what's going to happen, this is what, how we're going to finance it, this is what it's going to cost you, all that information. Then if they don't want it, they have to actively protest it by sending a letter or coming to City Hall and signing off saying I'm protesting this. If there's not sufficient protest, then you move forward with it. And if there is sufficient protest, over half is a good mark, then it's it's dead. Who decides that? So who decides the percentage? We we did in terms of telling people on a street, this is what's going to happen. If you're going to say no, better do it now, or else you're going to. And then the opposite. If you've got a street of people that said this is unacceptable, and a hundred percent of those landowners on that street say, yeah, we want an SID. We want it. We want to assess ourselves money to deal with this. Has anyone been to Bozeman before? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So you peel off there on 7th <clears throat> Avenue. You drive up to 7th to Main Street, you make that little jog and go up 8th Avenue up towards campus. Slow. Yeah. 8th Avenue looked like terrible. <laughs> it, was, it used to be the gateway <clears throat> to the university. And it had gone into such disrepair it looked awful. The meeting was a big mess. It was, it was weeds. It was oh, it was just a mess. And it was not a good, it was not a good image for the city of Bozeman as they're trying to portray as a community and as a university. So what they did is they said, look, we need to fix this. We need to make this look better. It, it, it's a mess. Potholes. It's a mess. It needs to be dealt with anyway. But it's also our grand entryway into the universities, right? So we need to fix this. So they they have a citywide SID for streets and curbs and gutters. Already exists citywide. They used money from that SID. They used, uh, I think, a little bit from their property tax. And then they created an SID in that neighborhood. And said, you also are going to benefit by this. It's going to be a nice street. Your property values are going to go up. So you've got skin in the game. right? We're going to help. You don't have to carry the full freight. But we're going to offset some of that, but, but you need to have some skin in the game. 
And so they had an SID for that little neighborhood, plus the, and I'm not sure how big it was, I'm not sure if it was just that block or if it extended out to a couple blocks, I'm not sure. But that's how they put that together. So they were able to fund that. Uh, and here's another example. There, uh, there's a, a community that called me and they said, look, we, we've got a landowner that's down this road, it's in town, owns a lot, all these lots are owned, but no one's developed it because there's no water or sewer. Now there's a guy that wants to build on that lot, but he's at the end of the road. But we can't, we can't afford to get water and sewer out to him, him or her, them. We can't get water out to him. So he's stuck. I can't develop because this county's not going to let me put in a septic and a, 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 a well. One, I don't think there's water there. They're not going to let me do that. I need city water and sewer, but I can't. So they're stuck. They could either pay for themselves to put in the water and sewer themselves. And the two, we'll just say $50,000 to extend those, those services out to their lot. And it's going to pass all those other lots to get out there. And he's like, I can't afford to do that. Right? I can't carry that full freight. So create an SID. Have all those property owners pay for that, and you can finance that over 20 years. So no one's carrying the big net all at once. He's paying into it, and all those property owners are going to benefit by having water sewer there. Now they can develop that land which they couldn't before. The property value of that land just skyrocketed. Now they can sell it or they can build on it because now it has water sewer services. Didn't have it before. That one person doesn't have to pay for it all themselves and the city didn't have to pay for it all themselves. It was shared equitably by that group. Is there a percentage of people that are landowners in there that is set by statute that have to agree on that SID? Is it 60%, 70%, 50%? What's the numbers? Is it by statute or is it something I, I that this... I think, well, we can look it up. I think it's sufficient, uh, might have been the words. I, I wanted to, let's get around my head, unless you know different, it's like 50% protest or more. You know, or just be the, the sense that the, the city council, it's a political decision. The city council just feels like, yeah, this, I'm just not feeling like this, we got buy in yet. Right? Okay. Uh, but usually they say if you want to have a hard line, it's got to be 50% protest. And so you can think of how many property owners and you kind of do some math and say, yeah, are we getting that formal, uh, formal protest? Let me, I, you know, I know you don't want to go into the weeds, but I want to get a little bit out of the weeds. Let me assume. Here's a, case, here's a case. I want to see improvement on a street. I do not live on that street, but it's the main access street for my neighborhood. I get 10 of my neighbors to come to the city council and say, we want an SID, but like, what's our next step? What do we need to do? So it, it, that's a political decision Correct. for, this, for the council. So they would have to say, well, is that something we want to, we have the political will to go down that path. And then they'd probably say, okay, We've got a request from some citizens that they would like to have this happen. So let's investigate what is it going to cost, what needs to be done. They've got to do some sort of recon. What's the road look like? What needs to be, you know, what's that going to cost? How do we finance well, it? Who could define the neighborhood? Now, in this case, I mean, these cases are all different. In this case, I'm looking at a street that is the main access for about half the people in one of our precincts. A lot of people would benefit from an improvement. Most of us do not live on that street. Yeah. Who gets to define that geography, the uh, uh, property geography? Council will. Right. And so it could be just that street and those adjacent landowners, but it could be a larger area because it comes down to who's benefiting from the service that's being invested in. Okay. So how big? So in our case, in that the town when I was mayor, we had the SID was the entire community, the, the city boundaries. Some okay, people came. Uh, love this. They came to city council and said, this isn't fair because I don't have a sidewalk and I don't have trees. It's not fair. And I said, exactly. It's equitable. Everybody's being treated the same. We're all deriving some level of benefit by having the trees, right? And so we're getting some benefit. We all benefit because we walk downtown. There is some tangible benefit that we're all receiving by having this taken care of. So we're all collectively going to pay into having this done. Right? And over time, we will be adding sidewalks when we deal with the existing sidewalk problems we have. Once that's dealt with, then we're going to be adding sidewalks. We have an infrastructure improvement plan over time, and you will eventually be benefiting from that right in your front. So that was kind of, they, they, didn't, they didn't like it, but they understood it. And they didn't protest it. 
I don't like it, but I get it. Yeah, we all have so, so how do you deal with it? the street he's talking about? Everybody knows it's full of us. Hey, hey, hey. And so you have the high school, uh, which is tons of kids drive it every day, leaving and going. There's also a, uh, at least one, if not two, governmental, U.S. governmental uh, businesses that are on that. So when you have those types of ownership, how are they included or are they excluded when we're looking at that in this? It's a great question. I have a really evil thought. I'd say just put barriers on it and say that's going to be a pedestrian walkway. <laughs> you know the parking lot and call it good. Uh, that's an idea. Uh, so federal, state, and school districts, because this is not a tax, it's not a property tax, it's a fee for a service. So those entities will have to pay that assessment also. So they're not exempt. The school district's not exempt. The federal government's building is not exempt. Which means we're still uh, and, and I'd even say the city wouldn't be exempt, right? So they would have to find some way to and you might disagree. They might have to find some way to pay for that assessment. It would just basically go from this pot of bucket and we're into this bucket. That's how you, you know use you pay your water bill, right? It comes from this bucket over into your enterprise bucket. So what if they refuse to pay? You were just saying they wouldn't pay, like the school. Yes. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh. So, yeah, so. Because it comes out of the tax statement, county, 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 they won't pay taxes, period. And so because it comes on, because it's a fee that comes on your on your tax statement, which a lot of fees do, they won't pay it. Just because the Montana Attorney General says it's so, <coughs> doesn't mean they will do it. Right. I think it was an ancient opinion or a Supreme Court case that defined those things. Yes, sir? Referring to your original question of equity versus fairness, I'm, I'm a little concerned. i got a corner lot. And since it's based on frontage, yep. my, my street maintenance is 12% of my property tax bill, and it's closer to 19% to add on things like drains and street lights. Yeah. What happens to somebody like me if you get an SID? You, you know, so you Are you hit on both sides? Yeah, you say it's yeah. equitable because I yeah. get one vote, but yeah. I also get to pay a reliance share of the money. Right. And so what we chose to do is you only pay for the frontage where your uh, your street addresses. So if I'm on if I'm on Third Avenue and Vine, I don't pay my frontage on Third and Vine. My street address is 219 Third Avenue. I pay for the frontage on 219. That part. Both that I don't live on, and how do I get charged for that? I mean, he's talking about fixing the road that he right. drives home on, not the road. That he so lives. so the idea of the, the the SID that might be so the SID. So here's your, uh, I don't know, does that look like city limits? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I recognize that. So it could, does that look familiar? So it could be that here's the street that you're looking at, right? And you could say here is the benefiting contingency, and we're going to draw a line around that route there. And there's going to be all sorts of ancillary and arteries and all that, and different roads in there. But that SID, the whole point is not necessary to fix Bullhook. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the problem with the priority. But all the roads in that area are going to be dealt with through this SID. The number one priority might be this one. When it's done, then it's going to, you're going to move out. As you get money, you're going to move out and do where the next highest priority, next highest priority. Basically, you're telling me I'm screwed because if I'm in that, if I'm in that area that you just drew, then I, I pay based on the frontage of both the side streets. No, I said on the one. It's on the one. one. Well, you're not paid in one of the roads I live on. So which one? Is not the today. Right. right. So so the idea is the the whole point of this is that we're going to deal with maintenance over time. We're going to deal with the the, the the so you probably have a priority list. If you create an SID, my guess is you're going to have a priority list. It's going to be. This road is going to be the first one, this one will be the second one, this one will be the third one, this one will be the fourth one, right? We're going to have a priority list of when we're going to deal with these roads. You're only going to be assessed for one side of your, of your lot. 
like everyone else will be assessed for one side of the lot. And you're going to, so the idea is somehow we've got to deal with this maintenance here because what's being done currently? No. Nothing. Nothing. And we have no more money in the buckets, right? We want it fixed. We have no money, so we've got to figure out how do we get the money, generate the revenue, to fix it. And that's, and that's the challenge. So you decide. You need to say, you know what, I'm okay. So somebody in a cul-de-sac basically doesn't have to pay anything. No. That, so, well, if the cul-de-sac is in here, they're paying like everyone else. Well, If you're in the district, you pay. They're paying for their five feet of frontage. And then I'm paying for, for the rest of the road that they drive to their house on, even though I never use it. If you have a large frontage, you pay a large amount. If you have a small frontage, you pay a small amount. Yeah. But I never, but I never use the road and they do. You use roads and have it, right? Not very much. No. Yeah. It's equitable. <laughs> Clearly, it's not fair for you, but it's equitable. We're treating you like everyone else in the room. Dan, what if, like, the road we're talking about is like the main worst one. The other ones are new developments, so a lot of them probably don't need anything done to them. Uh, today. 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 Yeah. today. So, so, 20 years. So are, you, are you saying that in, with, the, with an SID, you would, first you fix the bad one, and then you just keep paying until the next street needs fixed in that area? Or Well, my guess is you're probably always going to be doing some maintenance. Mm -hmm. Roads, okay. they, yeah, they're always being used. Just like so, over yeah, so... So it's going to take a, probably some time to, so here's the other thing. Once you get an SID and you can calculate how much, whatever the rate is and how much you're going to generate each year, it may be that you're collecting, we'll just say 200000 a year. I'm just making wet numbers up here. But whatever project you want to get done, it's going to cost you $1 million. Right? You can either wait, was it five years? Yeah. You wait five years to do the project. Or you can borrow money from the state's intercap loan program with the payment coming from your SID. Hmm. You can take care of that right away, hmm. and then after after the loan's paid off, right? Then you say, okay, now we've got another ten years left on our SID. We're going to collect another million dollars. What else are we going to do? Chip sealing. We, you know, you do all sorts of things. That's within the, the within the defined what you can do with those funds and try to maintain that whole district system. So, so for people in here who specifically are in a different specific neighborhood and they want to start an SID, what's the first thing that they do? So if there's a if there's a neighborhood or a street that wants to do an SID, they could petition. If there's 100% of them say, yeah, we want this, petition the city. The city's like, great, we'll do it. So they just write it up and come to a meeting and say, hey, we want an SID here. That's and I would suggest you talk with the city yeah. first and make sure the old council's okay with the way you go about the petition process. And so. But yeah, they can, they can, so you can either impose it upon yourself as a neighborhood or as a community, or the city can initiate it and say, we've got to solve our problem because our revenue is lacking and we have a duty to maintain these, the system. Yeah. So I understand that. So now there's a group, there's a group of people in a four block area that want to do an SID. So they say, yep, we want to do it. They come to the city, say, we want to do, we've got 100% of the people. Okay, between doing a petition to notice of intent to create and creating the, the SID, you have to have that engineered and designed and everything else. If you're doing streets and everything else, because you have to have a price to be able to go out to bid and say that we say it's going to cost $500,000. So you, now you get an engineer, so you've got cost of engineering. Yeah. You got cost of engineering, five hundred thousand. Bid comes in seven hundred thousand. The people say we said five hundred, seven hundred thousand, no way. Yeah. Okay, you've got money invested in the engineer. Who pays for that? City. Exactly. Yeah. So it comes out, but that comes out of the funds that we do for any. I mean, it has to come out of one of the buckets. Yeah. Yeah, so so you could, you know, so depending on how, um, ideally it would be nice to have an engineer review it and, or, or do a preliminary engineering report. Which I think you, are there still some grants available for PERs? So you might be able to find some grant funds to help offset some of these expenses up front. Uh, so I've been doing this a long time. And <coughs> in the first years that we had, people were doing SIDs. 
So the engineers would basically pro bono say, hey, we can give you, we can give you a cost estimate, yeah. we can do all of this. Because they would get, in return, when you did the SID, they would get the engineering fees and everything to do that. We don't have that. We built, we built, this year we've got two new houses that are being built this year. So we don't have a lot of stuff that's going on. You know, when you talk about, hey, we can extend the water out and these people are gonna be happy because they can sell lots. Well, right. I know a contractor in town that's got 14 lots for sale. He's probably had for sale for three or four years. Yeah. So yeah. there's some issues there of where you come up with the money to pay for this stuff. Right. And so some of it can be an estimate, right? You, you just figure out, we estimate it to be this much. And you can go on that. You can invest in a big, you know, preliminary engineering report, which would be more more investment. Um, you know, so you you need to decide administratively how you want to go about finding out what the estimates going to be. But you've got a twenty year time horizon, and you know it's not going to get any. The roads aren't going to get any better on their own. Right. Well, so Cost is going to get any less. So you've got to do so. You've got to figure out how do we move forward. Try to be judicious and. No, but and, and yeah. So, are you talking about two separate SID situations? There's a lot of yeah. Well, and what we're looking at <coughs> the situation that Terry and the rest, their bulldog area, they want to get together. They get everybody together, or the city says we want to do right. this area. Right. I mean, that's kind of where we're at. Right? Yeah. So you so you've got the flexibility. You can do. A citywide SID, which you have a couple now. No. No, they're expiring. Or no, they're just they're just there, just neighborhood. Neighborhood. Okay. So 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 it's not it's not uh, new to the city of Haver, uh, but it's probably something that hasn't been uh, initiated in a long time. So it's kind of new to this group or in your your consciousness. Well, but you, but sizes are. Yeah. What, what so as a, as a revenue source, you're losing revenue sources because your SIDs, you used to have a lot of SIDs investing in maintaining the community. Those have all gone by the wayside. Now, there's a reason why the town doesn't look the same as it did probably 20 years ago. I'm just guessing that, yep. yeah, we've, we've stopped making this investment. Yep. And so now it's expensive to try to bring it back up to snuff. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask Dave, what would you guess uh, percentage-wise as far, uh, you know, like the water and sewer lines? I mean, we're kind of talking paving. Is that kind of? Hey, but I mean, there's a variety of ways. The water and sewer is probably the critical part, right? Uh, I mean, is that? Well, I can tell you right now, with the high state highway project that we got going on to finish up in Highland Park, to go from 11th Street to 8th Avenue West, which is I call the back road to Highland Park. Mm -hmm. That's roughly four blocks. To put in water is four hundred and fifty-three thousand dollars for a new water line. For a new water line, four hundred and fifty-three. Because see, where we live, I mean, I presume that whole our area. If we got together with an SID, I mean, it sure looked nice in front of my fiveplex if I had brand new streets <laughs> for one block. What the hell are you going to do with one block? So I mean, it needs to go from. The football field right. all the way to the east end. But, yeah. I mean, can you do that then? I mean, have one street that. Okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I like the idea of citywide SID because you need 51% to say. Make it political now. Yay. <laughs> so, so I say I'm going to do a citywide SID for $2 million for 20 years. No different than the mill levy that we talked about, but the cities, people don't have to vote on it. Right? Yeah. So now you come in and say, we're going to do a million and a half dollars a year for 20 years as a citywide SID. Now we need 51% of the people to say no. Correct? Mm -hmm. There you go. So they all would have to come to the meeting. They all would have to come into the city at some point in time and say no. Each property owner would have to say no. I don't. The city would have to send it out to everybody. But those people would have to say no. It wouldn't be relied on a vote of... 50% of the people that go out and vote say it happened. Mm -hmm. You get, way, you get what I'm talking about? The so way I look at the statute, though, it actually could be one person if they had a legitimate uh, reason for not doing it. And the council, the council could say that, yeah, you're, 
You're right. You're right. You're, you, that is way out of line that one person could take out the SID. It's sufficient. And there's some other things too, if it's the majority, you know, this is why East, what was it, uh, Laurel can annex, another thing, can annex there that uh, Harvest State's refinery to have it part of city limits. Wouldn't that be great to have a refinery paying taxes in your community? But because they're the sole landowner and the protest, it's not going to happen. They need to build a subdivision right next to it <laughs> to fuse their vote and say, no, we've got 50 people here that want to be in. But, so that's that's one of the reasons why. But they are a good partner and all those other things they get the water from and all that. But, but, I, but have yeah. to, I have to come back, though, Dave, even though that sounds wonderful. I mean, I, I totally get it after the frustration of two melodies. But even at a million and a half, we're back to well, yeah, fixing back to very few at. streets. Yes. Yeah. I mean, but, but you know, right. and you guys, I believe, Please don't jump on me because, man, I was for the mill of it. And I went out and pushed hard to get it because I still believe in the greater good of the mill levy. But the problem is, is that people do not want to pay. I've heard it loud and clear now for four or six years while I've been on the council. They want to pay to fix their street. And, and I think that that we really need to listen to that. I mean, I'm still, I, I still believe the other way, but I believe that we're going to have better luck if people actually pay to fix their street. Now, it's going to be harder on the city because how do we pay for the engineering costs to get there? But, Roll but into I the SID. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 I guess I'd like to give some historical perspective here. I'm I'm old as dirt, so um, <laughs> Fred Hartson, Ron Baston, and Mike Mariani, they did a whole plan for the city for SIDs. I used to sell real estate years ago in town. There was very few homes that didn't have SID tax on them. They went out and said, this place needs to be improved. It's on gravel roads. This place needs new sewer. This area needs... And they went out and individually sold those programs. And so then it was a, almost a citywide SID plan because the majority of those homeowners said, yeah, we want to have our streets paved. We want to have sidewalks at some time. We want to have some street lights at some time. So it became very, very common. When you sold a house, it automatically had an SID tax. It was part of the normal part of property tax. But people appreciated that because they had paved streets and it improved the value of their property. I would like to see the city really get into an intensive plan to do that, to go do some districts again like that. And a portion of that SID goes to those streets that are poorly represented people are not going to say yes I'm going to vote for higher taxes because they barely can pay for their utilities so a portion of that SID that maybe goes to fix Glow Ed and 16th Street and all, you know different places down there a portion of that goes to fix some of our main thoroughfares that are in, in bad bad repair and I think unless the city gets a hold of this thing and grabs a hold of it and and brings the whole plan into it, you're right. You cannot look at, at small individual SIDs with the engineering plans. I agree with that. And it sh they shouldn't be so crazy expensive anymore. But I think if we could get six, seven SID districts together with a big, big plan, then it would be feasible. And I think we got to think big because it's time, guys. Haver's looking pretty shabby. So... Um, we need to do it. I'm a property owner. I don't want to pay higher taxes. Uh, but you know what? I kind of feel bad when I have to repair a water line at one of my properties and I have to tie into some of the city lines. I feel kind of sorry for the city because I've got pretty spiffy stuff now and I'm, I'm tying into stuff that, you know, they're having to come back and repair and repair and repair. And that's, there's a cost of doing that too. I mean, every time these poor guys have to come and dig up a street when it's 40 below zero, we have a thaw. There's a cost of that to all of us taxpayers. So that's what I'd like to say. Yeah. Thanks, I'm not going to say I wrote a citywide plan again, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. I'm very sympathetic to Terry. 
Terry was a leader in the effort for that for that citywide plan. The other person who was a leader in that effort was also in my precinct. Guess which precinct twice did not support that plan? That has to do with property values and ta and rates. So in my case, my tax aid, my taxes would have gone up, I think, something like eight hundred dollars a year for a plan that would never have benefited me. Ever. All right, in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. The problem is our city need is enormous because of long term deferments. I don't think you're gonna get anywhere with a city plan because the cost is so great to do a total plan. I mean if I was going to pay $800 a year for a plan that would, in 30 years, not have addressed my property, how much would I have had to pay for a plan that would have addressed my street needs? Follow me? Good point. I think we're much like, more likely to get somewhere neighborhood by neighborhood at this point. Yeah, these are all great. This is something well, I mean, it's, 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 you have to continue to have this discussion. Mm -hmm trying to get your head wrapped around how are we going to do this and and how do we represent the, the your varying model discussions model. right your and so it's model. either going to be lots of smaller ones there's some value and so there's some value in having a large SID because everyone's paying in and the cost is lower right there's it's not gonna be as high if everyone shares it it's a smaller one, it's gonna be higher but there's gonna be a more direct impact so all these things are valid arguments and it all has to be weighed out Council members in the room, you've got to weigh all these different things and you've got to figure out how are we going to solve the problem. If we could all agree, doing nothing is not an option. No. Right? So if, right. if, if you start at that point, something has to be done. Then the question is, how do we peel that out? Right? How do we get this to work? And we've got to figure out. But you're no, well, yeah, I can't say no. But yeah, you've got to figure out how to solve the, the problem. And, and who, who, and how are we going to pay for financing? Are SIDs always on square frontage? Or no, there's a variety of ways in which you can finance. That was just one option. Okay. There's a variety of ways in which you can finance it, and so you've got to determine, you know, and how how are we going to share the next? So if it's frontage, right? That's your concern. I'm I'm concerned with the frontage part because it might. So you might advocate for a different method that that might be more equitable in your eyes. Right? It might be on square footage of the lot. I might have a long frontage, but a very narrow lot or whatever, right? I don't have, you know, so you can figure that out, but it's, but you've got to figure out and have the conversation, what, what are our options and how do we do it? That's a future discussion, I guess, I think you need to continue having. I want to just kind of kick the can a bit, rattle the beehive and say, hey, <laughs> I just want to present that, that issue that you got a lot of stuff going on here that the city, made up of all of you citizens, in a representative fashion, you've come together to say, we need to deal with these collectively. And it's expensive, and it's not getting any cheaper. And currently, the legislature only gives us so many buckets to use, right? We're getting fatigued, right? We're getting fatigued on our property tax or, or these other assessments and fees, because we only have <coughs> so many options. So. And there's not a lot of grants out there. There's not a lot of other programs that we can access. So, so that's so there you are. It's just going to be hard, and there's no easy answer that doesn't require somebody writing checks. Is there a liability for the city if the council decides that they want an SOE in a specific area, and not and not enough people oppose it? I mean, there's one person who's very much against it for whatever reason that maybe the council doesn't agree with. Is the city at liability? Is there a way that they, you know what I mean? Oh, they could sue. But, but if they went through the process correctly, mm -hmm. the city will prevail. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So, yeah, if, you know, if they screw up the process and don't give people due process, an opportunity to, to come and, and to protest, when you didn't send out the letters properly, or I didn't receive the letter, or whatever, so I didn't know, so I might have grounds for a suit that might be justified, but it had not have a little thing. So I'm going to make sure they, they Cross their T's and dot their I's. The process, yeah. But there's also there's there's also when you come back to the talk about the duty, you have a duty to provide a level of say fire protection. And if it's found that you're not meeting your duty, is there a liability there too? 
right? Yes, sir. So it seems to me that we could possibly have multiple SIDs. That you could possibly identify as a municipality all the very important infrastructure and streets and sewer and stuff like that that absolutely need to be repaired for the for the good of the whole. And so we have a smaller, somewhat smaller SID than an entire SID for the entire community. But then we had neighborhood SIDs as well to take care of the direct impact needs of the, the neighborhoods that we got. So we got we got one for the city that takes care of what it really feels is critical. And then we got another one for the neighborhoods that needs to be repaired and that want to have an SID for that neighborhood. Um, can I can I respond to that? <laughs> I, I, I yes, I completely agree we could. But the problem is is we tried to do a mill levy but didn't address everything and we couldn't get that approved. So to once if you pass an SID that's citywide, I would say that the chances of passing a neighborhood SID are lower. Correct. Correct. I think you'd be better off to do the neighborhood ones because then you'd you'd pick say four or five like this woman back here said. Pick some critical places in town that we need fixed and create SIDs in those areas and then you know then you don't have to worry about that person not wanting to pay because they're benefiting from it. Where I could see the mill levy not passing because <coughs> there were people that didn't think they benefited from the money that we would all have to pay. Jump and in the the legislature loosening the you know the resort tax issue that a place like Whitefish that's so high end they can charge a resort tax. We have plenty of tourists coming through on Highway 2, yet we can't, we can't have some of those things. You see the legislature, any effort to go there and say, if you're going to allow Whitefish or Red Big Lodge. Sky and Red Lodge to do it, I can't do it. So, so, great question, and I, and I love it, and I'll respond in this way. Who are you electing to send to Helena and represent you? And how do they feel about this? It seems there's a disconnect. We elect certain people with a certain philosophy, we send to Helena to represent us, and then we're ticked off because they're not doing what we want. Well, you elected them. So start figuring out, push on those candidates. What are your thoughts about adding another box here? Right? And we're only going to send people to Helena that are interested in another box. If, if indeed you're, you know, so it's all politics, right? So they're going to reflect, you knew who I was when you elected me, and I did not stand for that. So why do you expect me to go for it now that I'm in office? Mm -hmm. So I, it, the pressure is mounting. The pressure is mounting to look at some sort of a local option tax. It's, so whether it's going to happen next year, four years, ten years, pressure's mounting. It may never happen. But I know the pressure's mounting. They're starting to feel the heat. They've got to deal with, on this local level, they've got to deal with the funding. Here's an, hmm, wasn't going to go here. I'm going here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so turn the cameras off. <laughs> so, one of the things that came out of, okay, let me we'll just back up. The city can raise. I'm probably using the wrong words, so don't jump in here, Doctor. Throw money at me, and I'll stop talking. Uh, <laughs> the city can raise its its <clears throat> mill value or its taxable. They can raise taxes half of the rate of inflation averaged out over the last three years. So if the average inflation rate is three percent <clears throat> over ten years, that's thirty percent of inflation. The city can only raise 15%. Do the math. Yeah. Right? You're getting further and further behind. That's why you look different 20 years ago than you do today. Yeah. Right? You're getting further and further behind. That's one issue. Local option tax, another issue. There's a lot of these issues out there that we need to deal. We need to deal with this as citizens. Find people to represent us to say we need to solve these problems. These are hard problems, and we're not getting ahead, we're falling behind. And the idea of less taxes, you know, who wants to pay taxes? 
But if you think about what are you paying for, you're not just writing a check that goes off into wherever, you're paying for these things, right? You're paying for the things we've all agreed we want to take care of. I want to have clean water, I want my poop to go somewhere, I want public safety, I want the fire department to show up, I want to drive on a safe street, I'm not, like, streets of Beirut, <laughs> burr, 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 need a four-wheel drive to get around town, go. How do you, uh, I'd like constituents come up and say, well, why well, didn't vote for the mill levy, because I don't trust the way the city manages money. And very, you know, very vague statement, but that's a very common opinion, I would say. It's, oh, I, I don't know what they're going to do with it. I don't trust that it's going to fix my street. Or I don't trust that it's going to be managed properly. How do you deal with that when you're trying to trying to fix stuff but people don't want to? What for, not that they don't want it fixed, but they don't trust that it's going to be, I don't know, for whatever reason. One more reason is why not having civics in high school anymore has <laughs> become a problem. Because I think a lot of people don't understand what's going on. They don't understand the correlation between what they're paying and how it's funding these things. right? So I don't understand when they say, I don't trust how the city's spending their money. I'm not sure what it is that they don't trust. I'm not here. I don't know what's going on. But I don't understand what they don't trust. And so if they're seeing, look, the whole, I keep paying my taxes, the whole place is falling around my ears. Well, yeah, because, cause, so we just need to educate the people. Because, you don't think education is going to help? That's true. Again, I've, because it's just so obvious, I live in a neighborhood. I live in a neighborhood where a series of bad planning that goes back, probably some of it goes back 80 or 90 years, I don't know, means access, essentially there's no decent access to the rest of the city from my neighborhood. And part of that is lack of repair, but part of it is bad planning. Bad planning for a, a drainage issue a few years ago. Uh, bad planning that allowed somebody a variance so that, I'm thinking of, uh, what is that? Maybe, that Heritage Drive. So Heritage Drive suddenly collapses into, a, into an alleyway. This is bad planning. So again, this is a reason really, in my view, for modest neighborhood defined plans that might be focused and planned well enough that we can avoid some of that. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to link most of the people involved in that planning are dead now. Right, right yeah. But but we're, we're all living out of someone else's dream. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're living today. Haver is living today in someone else's vision. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the question. <clears throat> what vision do you have for the next 20 year, the, the generation, the next that's coming up? Yeah. Right? That's the, that's the question you need to wrestle with, that we are living on someone else's investment. They sacrificed to build what you have today. How are we, as stewards of this investment, and what are we leaving for the next generation? It's not easy. It's not easy. It's hard. It's expensive. You've had your hand up a couple times. Here you go. So yeah, you, you said, you. you know, if you've been to Bozeman, right? I mean, everything has a little tax, right? <laughs> Can the city somehow figure out a way to put taxes on, like I said, like a sugar tax. You know, I've seen that all over in other places in Montana. No, yeah. You know, no. you don't have those I've options in Montana. You don't have those options. It's like the soda tax? Yeah. State regulates the taxes. It's not something we have any control of that locally, other, unless you want to vote in a melt levy to raise your taxes. But you can't put a, a tax, unless you're a resort tax, that you vote to say we're a resort tax area, district, or town, uh, like Whitefish. They voted to say, yeah, we want to have a 3% tax on luxury items, right? Things that tourists would use. You want to go down and buy a pair of work gloves, that's not taxed. I want to go to the grocery store or buy medicine or buy a washer dryer, that's not taxed. But I want to have whiskey and a fancy dinner, that's taxed. How would a charter, if you became a chartered government, how would that allow us more freedom? Oh, sister, that's another exciting conversation. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so right now, do we want to go there? I don't, I don't really do you want, want, there's no quick with me. You have been here for what, an hour? This is not quick. It's been an hour and a half. We might need to come back for this conversation. Yeah, so, so let me come to yes. So let's wrap up this SID conversation and we can maybe touch on this because I think that's also kind of an undercurrent here. So this, if, if you were to, so part of this is getting with bond council and everything else. If you were to say, we want an SID, this is how much money we generate, you can go out and sell those bonds. There's a variety of ways in which you can 
So usually if it's a huge infrastructure project, it's going to be millions of dollars you want to sell bonds. And then it'll be paid off through your SID over time. If it's a small project, you might go to the intercap down the state, down the state government. They have a, a loan set up, like a fifty thousand dollar project, you just borrow against that and pay off. You know, if it's a smaller neighborhood thing, right? But you could sell enough to do the whole city. Yeah, perfect. So, so there's a variety of ways. So, and I wanted to. I so as I was up here drawing pictures, I have a variety of colors mapping out the whole city boundaries. One color might represent a certain SID for a certain service, water. One might be for sewer maintenance. One might be transportation maintenance. And it's, it could be a slow burn, slow grade SID that we're just generating money from everybody on, in that specific area. Right? And then we can have these smaller neighborhood SIDs that we can leverage the collective with the individual. You got skin in the game. We all got skin in the game. We all live here. I may never drive in that road, but it's part of my community. It's part of who we are. We're connected. We're connected by roads and pipes. That's what brings us together as a community and other stuff too. But that's what brings us together as, as a municipality. So we are all in this together. We're going to share the load. But you that's going to derive that direct benefit, you also got to have a little bit more skin. <coughs> so there's, like I said, there's a hundred ways you can slice and dice this thing. But you need to have the conversation. So there could be some larger overlaid SID, slow burn, everyone's pitching in gives you some money to leverage to help out on some of these other special projects. But they don't, because some of this stuff, it's like, there's no way. Buck Creek, what is it? Bullock. 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 But there, there may be no way that those adjacent landowners are going to cough up the money and have the money to fix that problem. Yeah. That may be a community problem. If every kid in town is driving up and down that road to go to school, that's a community. <clears throat> right? So, but this is... I'm not going to solve your problems. You've got to solve your own problems. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to own it. But I'm just telling you there's a lot of options. There's a lot of options. Don't let it. It just takes a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion. Try to find out. But I hope I'm going to kind of rattle you a little bit to start thinking a little bit differently about how we want to address this. Right? Educating people. How do we have this discussion? What, what's the most priority unit that we have here? If we were to create citywide SIDs that are these slow burn, what would they be in? Right? So part of it is you're peeling back to your capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. right? what, is the, what does the plan say? And how far behind are we in certain... Cascade County had no plan for their county roof, the county courthouse roof. Have you seen the courthouse? There's a huge old courthouse. Yeah. They had, I can't remember when they finally said this is enough, they had like 24 buckets, five gallon buckets all over the fourth floor, or third floor, or whatever it was, mm -hmm. capturing waters and dripping in every time it rained. And they said, you know, because they had no money in their capital projects, they had to use out of their fund, out of their, the bucket, $3 million, $3.5 million to fix their roof because they had no plan to address the roof. And they said, we can't have this happen again. So they've done an intensive work in trying to develop a capital improvement program that makes sure that they are taking care of their assets over time because they just can't afford to say, all right, everybody's got to cut back the equivalent of $3.5 million so we can pay for this project. Right? You don't want that living crisis to crisis. So how do you get on the front end of that curve to figure out how do we pay for the services that we demand in a creative, and I think the SID is probably the most creative way that you can customize it however you want. I've given you a variety of options to look at it, and you might come up with six or seven new different unique ways to do it. But it's a tool you have in your toolbox you don't have many. And if you, if you pitch it to the side, and you're not gonna you're not gonna vote for a mill levy, then everybody gets a jacked up four wheel drive and just say that's how it's gonna be. <laughs> Streets of Beirut in, in Hammond, Montana. Yes, sir. You know, I I guess I'm one of those people that's old enough. You know, we had SIDs that got paid off. You know, and now we got the same problem again. SIDs are just a short term fix. Yes, they are. You know, so. The, the, our successors can be sitting here in what constitutes this same room mm -hmm. trying to solve a problem that we solve today. Yeah. So, okay, maybe we can get by with an SRD and we're long dead, so we're not going to be concerned about it exactly. in the future. But, you know, having this capital improvement <coughs> sort of thing can be a permanent sort of fix. Mm -hmm. But it also strikes me that there ought to be alternatives in between, you know, where we can 
figure out some other way, and if it's a matter of changing the law, okay, yeah. we ought to do that. You know, Come up with a good proposal and help the legislature see that you're not the only ones with this issue. Yeah. You're not the only ones with this issue. This is having this conversation, not as acute, and, and good for you guys for having this conversation. This is a conversation that's a slow burn across the state. It's, it's an issue that, is, that we are struggling with. As I said, as, as the cost of doing the inflation goes up, you're on well, half of that. And you're getting further and further behind. And so you've got so which and and the federal and state funds that helped out with these product kind of projects are going away. So it's coming back to you, and all your SIVs kind of expired, which they last for 20 years, right? So then either we re-up it or we don't have the political will to re-up it, or that's was solved and we don't feel we need to come back to it. Right? Whatever, whatever the logic was, right or wrong, it is what it is today. Right? So we can beat up the, the previous generations, but it still doesn't solve the problem today. But, but the important part is identify, right? Identify what is it that got us in this jam so we don't do it again, yep. right? Let's learn from our mistakes and make sure we've got a plan to make sure that this doesn't happen, that we are good stewards and leaving something behind, you know, for the next generation. Because the last generation left behind this for us. What do we read? It's just part of the yeah. yeah, the cemetery, you try it. They won't vote. So you want to do a quick conversation? Yeah, I earlier. He's still alive. He still do some of it for free. He cares about the city. But I suppose it wouldn't be accepted. However, if we're talking about the dangerous thing to do, that's not you men like me hang uh, We do it all the time for the city for things like water and sewer, and we've been very successful at that. And then we use that planning document to get construction dollars from various programs at the state or federal level. But when it comes to streets, that's not available. Right, right. But the other thing is, a lot of people complain about the potholes in the streets. But they have to realize that what's below. underneath is what's causing these potholes. It's because right. we've got water breaks and we've got all these issues and that's what's causing the streets to decay. Yep. So they just want the band-aid for the streets. That's what they're complaining about. They have to realize that it's going to cost more because what's going Well, we're going to fix it and then the pipes underneath are still bad. And we're going to go and tear it up every Which goes back to poor planning. So when we did our big water project that I was talking about the small town, we decided, as part of that overall, that first phase, 200 and some odd thousand dollars was for repaving the streets. Because what's going to happen is you're going to dig all this up, you replace the pipes, you're going to put the dirt back in, you're going to pave it. What's going to happen to that dirt over the next year? It's going to settle. And now we're going to have this little swale, this little gully right in the middle of our street. So what are we going to be doing for the next 30 years? We're going to be dumping cold mix in there. Creating pot. It's just going to be, we just saw that in the long term, we're going to be, so we took out of that budget the $200,000 and put it aside, and we said, and we just told the public very clearly, we're not fixing those trench That's lines right. for a year. That's right. We, as it, as it settles, we're going to come dump gravel in it, we're going to keep it safe, but we're not fixing it for a year. We're going to let it all settle, and then we'll come back and then we'll, we'll redo that section. And where we can, we're going to fix it. We had never paved a road in that town. It was chip seal over chip seal over chip seal. We had seven inches of chip seal. Never engineered, right? So, so that's what we're working with. So now we come in and put this nice, lovely asphalt. It's the most chip seal. Oh my goodness. But so those are some of the things, right? It's, it's a legacy that you're left with. And that's all the more that we had the money in the community over the years was the chip sealing. So, so either we're going to be okay with chip sealed roads, or we're going to make the investment and change that. It's and it's entirely up to the community. You've got and that's what you have elected officials for, right? They're supposed to listen and hear and try to reflect and facilitate the public process. <coughs> what is it that you're willing to pay for, and how do you want to pay for it? But mind you, we can't ignore some of these things. We've got to do something, right? So I tell my kids, you've got to do something, but you can't do everything. Thanks for Start coming. Right. Do anything you want. Anyway, whole other conversation about raising teenagers. All right. Any other questions about the SID before? I'll just briefly touch on this whole charter, charter self-governing powers, and all that stuff, and then we'll let you go. Yes, sir. So, with the SID, is there a maximum amount that somebody has to pay, like a flat rate? Like, okay, 
this house is going to pay uh, 100000 over the period of this. So is it leveled like that, or is it going to fluctuate as rates change? So you establish year? the SID with a rate, and then that's the rate. So if somebody, if they had the money, they could pay off it. their chunk. Let's, and say, let's suppose they had the money now, pay their chunk off, not have to worry about it for the rest of their time, because in 20 years they might not be making that kind of money anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's an option. Yeah, you can, you can yeah. pay forward an SID, you pay forward, and you don't pay the interest. So yep. okay. you, pay, you pay the the regular amount, otherwise it's, it's based on your rate plus the interest, and it, and it fluctuates as it goes down after the 20 years. You're not paying as much on the 20th year as you did the first year. But they're not an individual. As an individual, they have to pay that off. So that's what happened a lot when somebody would sell a house. They would pay off the SID, but it would be a lesser amount because you're not paying that interest off to the bondholder. So and there, there's like 90 different statutes on this. I didn't read them all. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to read them all. I, I read enough to figure out how to get myself in, in trouble here. But uh, yeah, there's there's a whole lot of the financing part that I figured that when it comes to that point, you can you can and if those are some questions you have, you can you can get down in the weeds. But that's that's kind of the easier territory for me. So do they immediately get a taxing or a value increase if they pay their chunk, or is that once the road is done? Since they already paid their due. Yeah, so it's it's usually your your property values is tied into what's around you. So if you increase the value of the of the property through a nice road and a sidewalk, so it's not necessarily tied to the SID value. Unless those realtors in the room would think otherwise. No one's saying otherwise. Well it's paid off. I mean, why not? The yeah, well, it's it's good. Good. yeah, but it it's might good. only be a couple thousand, I don't know, whatever it might be. Maybe lots of money. Might be a selling point. Charter. Charter. Self-care. Okay. So here's the deal, folks. There are all right. More stuff here. Power or oh or and plan. You're thinking, man, we've got a little series going on. It's crazy ball kind of time. There are two types of powers available to local governments in the state of Montana. And at some point, the city of Haver chose, well, in 1976, the city of Haver chose in a ballot that you are going to retain your existing form of government, which means you have general, general governing powers. That is the power the city has, and the power the county has is general governing powers. What that means is you have the power, you can exercise only those powers that are expressly granted to you by the law or the Constitution. If the law does not say you can do it, the assumption is you cannot. Right? So that's general government powers. The legislature gives you the power to exercise. If they don't give it to you, you can't use it. The other option is self-government powers. What that means is home rule is another name for it. What that means is if you can exercise any power or authority that's not prohibited by the law or constitution. So if it doesn't specifically say you cannot do this, the assumption is that you can. You know this is the difference? So now, in recent history, you've been wrestling with some issues in your community, and you can't fully engage in what you want to have happen because the law doesn't allow you to exercise that kind of power. They have not granted you that power. So you can't do it. Or you could, but they just won't, they'll just, eh, we're not doing that. So the self-governing powers is you can exercise any power that's not prohibited. Now, if you get all excited about that, I'll just tell you this. All the cool things you might want to do with that self-governing powers, a lot of the fun stuff off the table. They're prohibited. Yeah. The legis and every time you start getting all excited about doing something really cool, the legislature says, oh yeah, we're going to take that away from you. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's a long list, a long, there's like 20 some odd different prohibited powers, and then there's other powers that have to be delegated. I didn't bring that hand out, but there's, uh, my, no, it's not on our website. Uh, if you want, I can email it to you. It's in the legislature, it's in the, the Montana Code Attitude. 7-1-111 to 117 or something. So can you give uh, maybe two or three specific so, examples so, yes. of self-governing powers that other cities do retain? So. 
So a general governing power, or, so if you have self-governing powers, here's an example yeah. of a prohibited power. Okay. If, if you say, look, we're self-governing powers, we don't have to comply with all your fees, DEQ. We're going to do our own thing with our water system. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, <laughs> you're going to comply with all the state fees. You're going to follow the state laws. You can't say, yeah, the Clean Water Act, we're not going to abide by that, right? So you have to, so they've taken that power away. They've taken away the power for you to increase your taxes, except through 1510-420, which says that you can go to a bill levy and ask the voters to increase it. You just can't, on your own as a city, raise taxes, right? Or do a, a sales tax, or any of those other taxes, that's reserved to the, to the state, right? And even if you were self-governing, you wouldn't be able to have a sales tax if you didn't meet the criteria for a resort tax. Those are some things, right? Uh, other powers, uh, for example, uh, there's uh, owning your own public utility like an electric, electric, electric. Generation. Yeah, city of Troy, Troy. has uh, a power generator. They have a hydroelectric facility, and they have their own city owned and operated utility electric company. utility utility company owned by the city. That is not a power granted in general government power. So they had to adopt self government powers in order to maintain their. Seiko is the same thing with it. They have their own gas system. So they have self government powers. Little tiny Seiko has self government powers in a chart. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the powers, right? Then there's the form that you operate with. There are, I don't know, five. We'll say five because I can't think of the Commission. Executive is one of those, and that's the form that you operate with here in, in Haver. You have a commission or a council or a legislative branch, and you have an executive branch. So if you remember back, or if you didn't get this in school, it makes my job harder. Three, the Venn diagram, three interlocking circles, thinking about government and its different branches. What do those branches represent? The circles? Executive, so we have the executive, legislative, and judicial. And the judicial. All right? So your local government, City of Haver, has all three of those branches of government. They have city council, right? The commission. Who are they answerable to? Who do they respond to or answer to? The citizens, the electorate. They are responsible and accountable to the electorate. Then you have an executive who is a mayor, which would be Mr. Solomon, Mayor Solomon, right? Who is he answerable to or responsible to? Oh! 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 oh. I'm about to put that in reverse. The public. He is also responsible to the electorate. The council is not the boss of the mayor. The mayor is not the boss of the council. They're co equal branches of government. Just listen to the radio, watch something on TV. You know, you kind of see this fight going on right now, and it's all about this. Okay. So, so we have a mayor who, so the legislature, what is their responsibility? What do they do? They create the laws and policies for the city. Big picture, how do we operate this in a big picture? What are the policies, what are the big picture's laws that we're going to operate with? When they pass an ordinance, pass a policy, then where does it go? To the mayor to execute, right? We're going to implement that policy. We're going to apply the policy. So that's why the mayor is responsible for all the administrative part of the city. All the employees operate underneath the direction of and supervision, quote unquote, of the mayor. All the cabinet, right? The cabinet would be the clerk's office, public works department, probably the library would be, I don't know, parks and rec, chief of police, fire police, or fire department. Those would be the cabinet, all the different departments, right, is a way to look at it. All right, so the, the policy-making body, executing body. Then we have this judicial, we got a judge in the room? Yeah. No, no? gone, here? But the, but the city judge is not our judicial. No, no, don't, don't, yeah, they don't, they don't look at the ordinances and say, does that, yeah, they don't do that. But they're, they're making sure that the, we're applying the law that's passed by the legislature and implemented by, or they're making sure it's, it's, being adjudicated, that we're, people have to process. So they write you a ticket for a barking dog or an at-large animal or something, they can come and plead your case and they will balance out, this is what the law says, this is what you're saying has happened, and we'll make judgment. Okay? So the whole system works that way. All right, 
Commission executive form of government. Most common form of government in the state uh, for municipalities. The next one would be the commission manager. Now, commission, we already decided who, is, who are they responsible or answerable to? People. The public. <coughs> they then hire, hmm, hire a manager based on knowledge, skill, and experience to act as the chief executive for the city. So now we have an experienced person here who then is implementing all the policies and laws. So there'll be a tipping point in your community when you get to a point, it's like, ugh, we're having a hard time finding someone with the capacity to, to manage this complicated organization. And maybe it's time for us to hire someone to do it. Schools have a school board, and they hire a superintendent, superintendent of schools, a professional who then manages that. We don't want school board members, mm, Trust me, you don't want school board members in a classroom evaluating teachers, yeah. right? That's not their job. Their job is figuring out the budget, the big picture things, the big 30,000 foot view, we're managing the school system, and we've hired someone who's going to implement that on the local level. Okay? Then we have the commission form of government. Commission form of government is where you have, well, so that's it. What's the most common commission form of government in the state? Counties. Who wears the executive branch? They are. They are the legislative branch and the executive branch. They pass the laws and they're also responsible for implementing the laws. And the next one we have commission presiding officer. And that's where we have an elected commission who then from their body, from the commission, like you have nine members. So if you were a commission presiding officer, your executive branch would be uh, where the commission would elect one of their own to serve as the presiding officer or the mayor. They still are a legislator. They still would vote. They would still pass or uh, make motions to be a member of the legislative body. And then when the meeting's over, they put their mayor hat on and become the mayor to execute that. That's a meeting you don't want to miss when they're choosing who the presiding officer would be. <laughs> and then the last one is the town meeting form of government which is not an option for you in the city of Haver because this is only available for communities that have 2,000 or less of population. And this is what we call direct democracy. This is what's popular in, the, in New England, where the, the electorate is also the legislative body. A quorum would be 10% of the, of the community, and they meet together at least annually to pass the budget, to uh, pass any ordinances and, and policies, and they would then uh, uh, choose as a community who their it's like a manager, they call it a city administrator. They call it a city administrator. And that person makes sure that the day-to-day -day operations take place. There's only one community in the state of Montana that operates with this form of government. Any guess? Any guess? Bueller. Bueller. It is close. Pinesdale. Well, Pinesdale in the Bitterroot Valley. Next to Hamilton, just up on the hill. Hmm. We'll say it's a homogenous community. <laughs> <laughs> you know that area at all? It's okay. So, so those are your forms of government. Then your plan of government is, is uh, have a, a, an anticipation that someone asked quickly. This is not quick, right? Okay. So I have, if you can see here, in the law, and I have copies, you can, there's not enough for everybody, but if you're interested one. The legislature sat down and created a statute that says, look, we're going to create a lot of options for you, the Senate Commission Executive Form of Government. There's a lot of options for you. We are going to choose, well, I'm going to get one of these options. We are going to choose for you a default option in a lot of different areas. And unless you, the electorate changes that, this is your default. Okay, so in 1976, you voted to accept the default the legislature provided for you. Whether you knew it or not, whether you're here or not, that's what's happening. So you're operating under the default. What that means is, if you look at 73.213, and 2.13 says, and this is, this is, I like this one, because I'm in the right spot to have this conversation. 2.13, is it right? No, I don't want to do 2.13. I want to do... I would do tonight. Mm. Types of election. Local government elections shall be conducted on a the default. You've got two options, partisan and nonpartisan. The default is 
partisan election. So the default is that the city average should be operating all their elections on a partisan basis. Well, a lot of communities just ignore that. But we're not doing that, we're just going to operate with nonpartisan elections. At some point in your past, you had a study commission that put on the ballot to, to ratify what was already in place. You were operating with nonpartisan elections, and they put on the ballot and said, we want to ask the voters to validate what we're currently doing in place already, which is nonpartisan elections. But they gave the option to be partisan. Guess what you chose to do? Instead of ratifying what you're currently doing, you chose to do partisan elections. So then you had to shift to what you were doing traditionally to what you had to do legally. And it wasn't until 2015 that you put on the ballot. Was it 15 or 16? Or? Recently, you put on the ballot that we want to go to nonpartisan. And then you said, yes, we want to go to nonpartisan. So now you have changed your plan of government by choosing a different option. Now, if you have one of these handouts, there will be a variety of, of options, like one to three or one to four options, and the ones that are in bold are the ones that the legislature pre-designated for you. If you want to change one of those, you have to vote the people to make that change. Here's another example. If you look at 23213, which says, thank you, it says a bunch of perfectly good. Oh, yeah. Supervision of personnel, right? So this is the four options that are available to you that the legislature should create. Yep. So there's a, lot of, there's a reason why most of the communities in the state of Montana operate with general government powers with the Mission Department of Government, because it works. By and large, it works. There's usually a compelling reason why someone wants to change. Right. So here it says, the executive may, so the mayor may, appoint and remove all employees of local government. Right? Strong mayor. Has the ability to hire, fire, supervise all the employees. No, no say so by the commission of the council. That would be one option that's available to you. Option two, appoint and remove, with the consent of the majority of the commission, all employees of local government. Ooh. Now we're taking a whole lot of power away from the mayor by saying you can only hire or fire people with the council's consent. Nobody's joining, no one's leaving without our say so. Ooh. Weak there. Next one. May appoint one or more administrative... Oh, wrong one. Uh, appoint, with the consent of the majority of the commission, all department heads. And remove department heads, it may appoint and remove all department employees. What that means is, think back to the cabinet. The mayor proposes, I'm going to hire so-and-so as the clerk, and the council can consent to that. If the council consents, then they're appointed for that position. But the removal and hiring and firing of all other employees is at the discretion of the mayor based on what? It's a, yeah. No, based on the policy adopted by the council. So the, the council can create the policy that governs how and yeah. when and what you do as a mayor. You follow the policy, but really, after the appointment of the council or the department heads, then it's all up to the mayor to manage those employees, discipline those employees, remove those employees. The council has no say. And, and that's, here's why I thought the, the last one is confusing. You've got these three options. And I just want to point this out, and, and, and we'll say at some point the wisdom of the legislature. <laughs> we'll just do it here. This continuum. At this end, appoint and fire and remove all employees. Complete control of the mayor. To this end, Appoint and remove all employees with consent of the council, right? No power other than with, with uh, it's a shared power. And what the legislature did is we're going to divide the difference right here. We're going to say on certain things, hiring the city attorney, hiring the public works director, hiring the, the clerk, hiring the police chief, the fire chief, is going to be appointed with our consent. After that, we're going to leave it up to you when you're passing the policy for the event. So they've split the difference between a very strong mayor to a very weak mayor and saying, look, we want you to really focus on this area right here. We want you to get along. It's been working. Now, the last one I'm going to put up here, I'm going to do this in red, and then I'll let you go home. Where does the charter fit in? The charter is only an option for you if you have self-governing powers. It's not an option for you with general government powers. What a charter is, is basically your local constitution. It defines your form of government, 
defines the different positions within that government, like the, the mayor, the council, or who's the executive branch, who's the legislative branch, what's their term of office, what are the qualifications, all that stuff that defines uh, define the city. What's the judicial going to be like? What are the duties and responsibilities of the mayor? What's the duties and responsibilities of the council? What's the, usually the charters just say, the judge, based on Montana code attitude. Whatever it says there is what we'll do. Um, so self-government, so this is where you can, you can provide that flexibility. If there are certain things we want to do, you can give yourself broad powers here in your charter, and then by ordinance and resolution is how you govern yourself. So if there's something that you're finding, you're bumping up to something here in the general government powers, legislature did not contemplate every opportunity for you to exercise your power. They said, well, this is what we're going to give you general powers, but if it's outside of this, you're going to have to ask permission. We're going to have to change the law and give you that power. Or create self-governing powers, develop a charter, and then you can do whatever you want to, well, not whatever you want to do, but you can, you can operate within, within these cycles. So there are some communities that preemptively said, we really have no compelling reason to adopt self-governing powers and develop a charter, but we don't know what's going to be presented to us in the future. We want to have all options on the table. So we are going to adopt self-governing powers and a charter so we can respond and we can be far more nimble to respond to an opportunity that presents itself than waiting for saying, oh gosh, we'd like that power. Well, let's all drive down to Helena and convince the legislature to give us that power. So over the years, that slowly happens, Title VII of the Montana Code Annotated grows by 20 pages a year. You know, they're, they're finding ways to develop and give, you know, as, as we evolve uh, as a state, and as it needs to evolve as a society, they try to be accommodating, but it's usually years behind the curve. Yeah. Can you give me an example of a benefit to self-governing Yeah, well, What's what's your, your your recent issue that you're dealing with? What is it, the vacant houses or something? Yeah. 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 So that's one thing. They said, here's a solution. Butte Silverville does it. Well, Butte Silverville has self-driving powers and a charter. So they and it's not a prohibitive activity. So they can create their own structure in order to say, if you have a vacant house, we want you to register, and we're going to have you uh, assess a fee on that for a variety of reasons. You got to have some sort of rationale for it. Right? It's going to increase patrols or whatever. There's some some reason why you would do that. But right now, you can't enforce that because you don't have the powers. It's not a power granted to you by the general government powers to create something like that. It's not within the, the list of powers that you have. So then you, by creating self governing powers, you just say, yeah, this is something we can do. Or not. But that's, a, I guess, an all-that's option uh, now. You got anything else, Bernie, you guys want to do that it's a job? Making properties and roads are really the things that's on like everybody's mind right now. <laughs> Wind blows here, right? Yeah. So it's, we'll pass a bunch of bonds, we'll put up a big bunch of windmills, and that's how we're going to finance our roads. We'll generate some revenue. Yeah? Yeah? Dig it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. You get two of them.